All right, welcome everyone. I am being joined today by Darren Gold. Darren Gold is a managing partner at Trium Group, where he advises and coaches CEOs and leadership teams at many of the world's most innovative companies, including, but not limited to, Roche, Dropbox, Lululem, yeah, Lululemon, uh, Sephora, Cisco, eBay, Activision, Warner Brothers, the list goes on. Uh, he's also the author of the of the latest best-selling book, Master Your Code, The Art and Wisdom and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. Darren Gold, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure. You bet. You bet. All right. So I always like to ask this question of, uh, of authors, and that is, what was the inspiration behind writing this book? You're sitting around going, hey, I got to do this. Talk, talk about the inspiration. Yeah, I wanted to write a book for a long time, but the the most immediate inspiration was I had a uh, an, my oldest, my son, was uh, going away to college. Uh, this was about uh, almost three years ago now, and I wrote him a letter, and it was a letter, kind of humbly speaking, which was wisdom from a father to his son. And I had sent the letter around, and before I knew it, it had been passed around thousands of times, and so I knew that there was something that was really deeply resonating for people in the letter and that there were perhaps a seat, the seed of a book in it. And so I really use that letter as both the kind of inspiration to write the book, but for the also the original construct of the book, which is essentially this guidebook to leading an extraordinary life. And uh, so that's that's really been the inspiration for me. You know what? And what a what a great way to, I guess, to get inspired. I mean, you, you sent out this yeah. letter, you're getting all this great feedback. I remember talking many years ago to Ken Blanchard and you know, he's famous for his uh, was it one minute manager. Right. And uh, you know, he had, he wasn't even thinking of a book. He just typed up some stuff, you know, stapled it and it started going viral for lack of better terms. This is back before things went viral. Right. Right. Uh, and you know, that turned into a book and you know, kind of the same way it was just all that feedback. And, you know, he turned it into a book. Yeah, I think many of the best books I've, uh, you know, read have been ones that have been inspired by something in the author's life. And certainly uh, that was the case for me. And the book, of course, is a, in some ways, a bit of a memoir. But uh, but most importantly, it's really a guidebook for others to to lead and live extraordinarily. And boy, do we need it in, in the times we're facing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead and do me a favor. Pop up the yeah. book real quick so people can see what it looks like. That's the book. We and we're going to put a link in the show notes as well. So you guys can grab the book. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, right now, more than ever, we have a wonderful time, if you will, an opportunity to be our very best, to show up and, and you know, lead our families, lead our communities, and, and uh, maybe not be so what's the word I'm looking for? So selfish. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of people making a run on water and toilet paper mm -hmm. and, and some other stuff. Uh, and we've seen some, unfortunately, we've seen some, other, some ugly side of, of what it is to be human, but yeah. we've also seen the opposite, you know, some wonderful sides of being human, people who are going out of the way to help their neighbor or their community. So recently somebody sent me a picture of a, of, uh, of a sign that a fire station had put up saying, you know, uh, free food and coffee for truckers. Cause right now truckers are, are working feverishly to, to keep up with our, <laughs> with our hoarding of toilet paper and, <laughs> and water and canned goods. And so, uh, but you're right. I think it's an extraordinary time to try to be extraordinary. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the essential premise of the book that I write about is that um, to lead it to be extraordinary in, in anything and, and particularly in extraordinary times requires choice. And much of our lives are lived out of an automatic um, program that runs us. I, I draw I draw a distinction very early on in the book between a program and a code. And I define program as a set of subconscious safety-based beliefs, values, and rules that automatically drive your behavior and limit your results. 
And then I contrast this with, with this definition of a code, which is a consciously chosen set of beliefs, values, and rules that is really purposefully designed to um, produce extraordinary results and serve you. And I think these times are very much an illustration that each one of us has a choice, if we're aware, uh, in terms of what we believe, how we act, and the results that we get. And if we're not careful, we let circumstances shape us versus shaping our circumstances. And I think that theme is kind of at the core of the book, this notion of everybody has the opportunity and responsibility to shape their environment, be the architect of their experience, not the other way around. And it's certainly yeah. playing out um, right now. And that's the big opportunity, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think most of us have been conditioned, have been brainwashed, programmed, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, for, from very early on, right? I mean, you know, you're supposed to go to school, get an education so you can get to, uh, to, to the college that's going to, you know, uh, cut, uh, get your career started. And of course, that paradigm, I think, is shifting quite a bit. Um, I think that, and I like your distinction between a code and a program. And, and I think most of us are just, you know, programmed. I mean, we're just, you know, in this box and, and it really takes an enormous effort and even courage to kind of break out of that mindset. Yeah, and it, and it starts with the awareness that you are being run by a program. And I, I, I shared the very quick story early on in the book of the two younger fish that are swimming and an older fish swims by and he says, hey boys, how's the water? And they say, what the hell is water? And it's a great metaphor for you know how we live our lives, which is we are operating out of a set of hidden subconscious beliefs and rules that really drive how we act. We think we're in choice, but for most of our lives, we are run by this set of conditioned uh, beliefs, values, and rules. And it isn't until that point that we actually start to begin to see the water that we have the ability to be really in choice. Um, we have the ability to be in, show up and act uh, in a way that's of our own choosing. And, and that is what I call the human superpower is the ability to choose the beliefs that you hold about any situation. And, uh, and it's extraordinary when you discover that and consistently apply it in life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think, you know, there, there has been a lot said about, uh, you know, when you hit, when you, when you get to around the age of 40, you kind of rediscover yourself. And I think what happens around the age of 40 for a lot of us is that we start peeling away this program and we start thinking for ourselves and we start realizing, you know, this is what's going to make me happy. You know, we see a lot of people in their 40s and 50s making career shifts, uh, you know, quitting jobs and starting their own business, uh, writing that book that they've been putting off for years and start living that life. And I think it just, you know, for a lot of us, it's, it's, you know, it's like almost hitting bottom or rediscovering yourself and start kind of, again, peeling away, you know, people's opinions and expectations. And you start freeing yourself from the program and you start creating your code. Yeah. Yeah. And it oftentimes requires what the late leadership uh, expert Warren Bettis called um, a crucible moment right? Some moment of crisis or some major inflection point. And, you know, as we're sitting here today in this current crisis, I actually see it as a, despite all of the hardship that I think will ensue for many people, an incredible opportunity um, for many people to see it as their crucible moment where um, they can make that kind of um, shift in awareness. And, and I'm not saying that everybody needs it, um, but certainly there, I know in my own case, it was right around that age and it was in kind of a crucible moment where I began to really ask the big questions. Who am I? Like, what am I doing here on this? Right. Planet? Like, what, what's my purpose? Um, what's going to really light me up? And it was out of those deep questions and they were forced by circumstances uh, that I began to discover, wait a second, I've been living life a pretty good one but like run on autopilot. What if I could be in choice about every, every situation that I encounter, how I interpret that situation and the actions I take. And that led to a decade long plus discovery of a body of wisdom that's been around for thousands of years. 
um, and an ability to synthesize it and apply it uh, to the modern world. And, and that's really, you know, that's what really my passion and, and, and my mission in life is to do that and then to share it with others. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. All right. So let's talk about uh, one of those things that, uh, you know, I'm sure that we all that you get asked this a lot. I know people are always thinking, what is the most important factor in being successful in life? Talk about this. Yeah, I've started to allude to it, but let me let me go in a little deeper. This notion of like, do circumstances shape me? Or do I say shape, shape my circumstances? That may be the most fundamental choice we have as human beings, that belief. Most of us, there was a psychologist in the 60s who came up with a notion called locus of control. Most of us operate out of this subconscious belief that circumstances shape up, which is called shape us, which is called an external locus of control. The world happens to me. The choice, and I think what really determines success in life is to say, hold on a second. I'm 100% responsible for my life. And I have a chapter with that title, chapter four. Um, and I can operate from an internal locus of control that I shape my circumstances. Now that doesn't mean there aren't things that are gonna be outside of my control. What it does mean that in every circumstance, there's always something I can do to affect any situation. And when I begin asking the question, what would I do if I were 100% responsible? Not because that's true, but because that question better serves me versus blaming circumstances or blaming someone else my whole world changes. And so what I found in my own experience working with very senior business leaders is what separates people from being really successful is they hold a belief about that's their circumstances that is very powerful, that they shape them, not the other way around. And there's 50 years of research, by the way, that studied the results of that belief and that shift in belief in virtually every dimension, finances, health, um, uh, education, career, people that have an internal locus of control have meaningfully and statistically significant levels of greater success in each of those areas. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I, you know, one, one of the great things about uh, being able to interview people and doing this for on a, going on a decade now is that I think one of the things that separates leaders and successful people from, let's say, not leaders or successful people is their willingness to say I'm, I'm in charge of all this right you know whether whether they are at fault for lack of better terms th they don't care about that they're not okay. concerned with blame game they're saying okay as the leader you know i'm in charge of all this you know i'm in charge of the good results as well as the bad results and and and, and i'm going to fix it and they take that responsibility on they take that leadership on and from there, they, they just create their own reality. They just they change it for the betterment of everybody. Yeah, it's a, you're, you're pointing to a really important distinction because taking responsibility does not mean blaming yourself, right? And that's such an important right. distinction. But, you know, you take this current situation we're in and it's very easy to quickly blame the environment, which you have every right to do, right? The question I, I say is, does that, is it true or does it serve you? Now, is it true? Of course, the environment, things are out of our control, but is that belief serving you? And the answer is always no. So this, this shift in beginning to see your environment from a place of 100% responsibility is a radical shift. And it doesn't mean I blame myself and it doesn't mean there aren't gonna be things that are outside of my control. What it does mean is I start to ask very different questions. And out of those different questions come totally different actions and different results. Yeah. Um, and, and, it's, and it's hard to do because it's, really conditioned in us. We have a strong desire to want to externalize responsibility and blame situations and others, sort of what we were taught to do as children. Right. Um, so it's a lot of unwinding of, of that programming, that conditioning that, that, that needs to happen. Right. Well, not only as children, but even as adults. I mean, yeah. adults, because I think what happens is somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, who's responsible for this problem? <laughs> And of course, everybody says, not me, you know, or, or whatever. They're going to point to whoever they can. Uh, and so I think it's just this, as you said, it's this program that's been running in us for years. And it follow, you know, started in childhood, as you pointed out, and follows us through adulthood. Uh, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what can I do on a daily basis, you know, to practice, you know, some of the stuff that you're talking about. Talk, you know, talk about this. Yeah, I um, 
I just literally published a blog today on this very point. It's such an important question and such an important thing for to adopt and this idea of a daily ritual. And one of my favorite stories is Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian who early in his career made a commitment that he was going to write a new joke. Didn't matter whether it was good or bad every single day. And he would put an X on his calendar and he connected those X's and he said, I'm never going to break the chain, which is I'm never going to miss a day. So what I always recommend people, regardless of what you want to accomplish in life, is to adopt a daily practice that you hold inviolate, meaning it will ne- the chain will never be broken. You'll never miss a day. And the thing that I recommend doing in the article, the blog I wrote today is own your day or your day will own you. And I really encourage people to, to um, have a morning ritual where they, it can, it's 10 minutes, right? Get up 10 minutes earlier than you otherwise would. And in that morning ritual, you can do a whole bunch of things, which we can talk about. But the one that I find most powerful is to envision what an extraordinary day is going to look like and set some intentions around it. What are my intended outcomes for the day? And then you cap it off at the end of the day with an honest assessment. You know, what did I do really well and what did... I, what could I have done better? That daily practice um, can be can, can be totally transformational. And I'd say any daily practice, anybody that holds a daily practice, the act of doing something every single day is the act of an extraordinary person. Yeah, you know what? And I like what you said there about taking some time to envision an extraordinary day. Not a good day, not a whatever, but an, an extraordinary day. What would that mean? And, you know, one of the things that I've learned, uh, again, just from the privilege of being able to interview people like yourself, is that, uh, you know, one of the mistakes that we make, and certainly one of the mistakes I used to make uh, when I was setting goals, for example, uh, when I was in the sales environment, I'm going to make 10 sales today. Well, that's very difficult to hold yourself accountable to because you have other people Right. That's going to change that result, right? You, you know, yeah. unless you're just going to try to crush everybody and force them into buying your product, the chances of you making 10 sales is not in your favor because it's in really somebody else's control. But what's in my control, if I was going to create, let's say, an extraordinary for extraordinary day for a salesperson, that might that might envision me contacting a hundred people before the end of the day. Yeah. And I would do it in a way that was in service to people and in a way that really um, fulfilled me. Right. And so, so it's like, I can live, I can have an extraordinary day there. And and that's what you're pointing to is an, an, a really incredible distinction. The Stoics was like the most important distinction of Stoicism, which is this ability to discern between what's in your control and what's not in your control. And what's in your control is how you show up, right? The effort you put in um, your ability to go all out, the results will follow. And so I think that's a, that's just an important distinction to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Because some, you know, again, there are some things that we're in hundred percent control in our attitude, uh, again, uh, envisioning that extraordinary day. Uh, and, and there's some things that are going to be out of that control. And I think that, uh, if you take res- ownership over your self, your right. actions, then I think you're going to have an extraordinary day. And I like the, the fact that you added, you know, those different caveats. Hey, I'm going to have an extraordinary day. I'm going to contact a hundred prospects, but I'm going to do it in a way that serves them versus me. And I'm going to have, you know, fun doing it, you know, and, and, and so you start adding all these, again, filters, if you will, these caveats, and, and you will have a much, much better day than, oh, I got to make a hundred phone calls. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't do it, then at the end of the day, you're taking stock, right? You know, successful people, right? Hold themselves accountable and they don't do it in a way that that beats themselves up, right? Or, you know, blames them, but learns from it. Like, what did I do today? Where did I fall a little short and what could I be doing better? And that process, that closed loop process of starting your day, making commitments, closing your day, assessing how you did, learning from it is the kind of, you know, kind of one inch of improvement that needs to happen every day. And you compound that and you're, you know, you're, it's you live an extraordinary life. And here's some of the things that I think that really slow people down is that they simply don't want to take the time, you know, 10 minutes to envision an extraordinary day is not really that long of a time. Uh, sometimes I will look back 
and I've spent three or four hours playing a video game. And I'm going, <laughs> man, was that, was that a, the best use of my time? Not that playing a video game is, there's nothing wrong with that, but right. you know, do you need three or four hours? Could you have done, you know, one or two hours anyway, that that's again, yeah. my, my own stuff. And, and, uh, especially when I think the fact that this is the same video game that I've had for years and, you know, and, and what happens is I get bored of it and I put it up for maybe a, a year or two and then I take it back out and play it again. <laughs> so it's like, I'm not learning anything new, really. So what a yeah. tremendous waste of time. Uh, let me ask you this. While you were writing the book, uh, did you have an experience either, you know, a professional or personal experience that maybe surprised you that, that, uh, that, that impacted you the most? Yeah, I think, uh, I've had fortunate to have so many of them personally and professionally. I think professionally, maybe the most profound experience was when I found myself in my first uh, CEO role and I was leading, uh, a large, um, education company. Uh, we were serving, I think about 15,000, adult learners. And I had this um, vision for really transforming not only the company I was leading, but the industry that we were in and really doing it by transforming the experience students were having in the classroom. I wanted to ha I wanted students, I use this word extraordinary a lot, but I wanted students to have an extraordinary experience. I thought it was our responsibility to give it. And it had to happen through extraordinary teaching. And that wasn't happening, uh, not at least not consistently. And so here I was evangelizing this vision for our company and industry without having ever taught before. And so I decided I needed to get in the classroom. And so I was, I became, I was CEO during the day and I taught a, uh, was a college instructor in the evening. I taught a class called success 100 and it was all about strategies for financial or academic, personal and career success. Okay. And I had an extraordinary experience designing the curriculum for that class and teaching those students. I had a, deep, deep appreciation for um, the role of, of teachers uh, through that experience. But more, maybe more importantly for me is it began this lifelong quest that I've been on to really explore the domains of philosophy and psychology and learning science, like how do, adult, how do adults change, transform and learn? And uh, so that was a very foundational experience. I love it. I, I want to pop up the book one more time. Uh, you can pop it up there as well. That'd be great. Uh, there it is. Master Your Code. Master Your Code. Uh, available at Amazon or wherever your favorite books are at. Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leadership Leading an Extraordinary Life. And you know, what's interesting to me is when you think about it, uh, you know, especially uh, if you believe in, in God. Okay. So, uh, and, and the great thing about you and I as parents is that, uh, we have, I guess, an, you know, some idea of what the relationship is, you know, for those of us who believe in God and that you didn't create children so they can have a crappy, mediocre life. I don't think God put us on this planet and say, Hey, go be mediocre. Um, don't be fulfilled. Uh, have a crappy existence and then die. Mm -hmm. I think that he put us on this planet so we can, you know, at least attempt to be extraordinary. And, you know, uh, I'm sure that, you know, for years there was a, a, a saying that we only use 10% 10 10 of our, our mind mm -hmm. or, or of a, you know, of our brain. And, and I think what that person meant to say is we only use 10% of our potential because yeah we get caught up in that programming, right? And, and and you go from work to home and home to work and, and you're in this, like you said, in this just program where you're just doing everything the same every day. And then in our conversation today, just taking that extra 10 minutes to envision an extraordinary day. That to me, for everybody watching and listening today, that right there is a massive takeaway. What would happen to your life if you just took that extra 10 minutes to start envisioning an extraordinary day? That that would start a chain reaction. That would really, it, you know, it, it could really change our world. Yeah, it does because it starts with a supposition that you have 
the possibility to create an extraordinary day, just that alone is a game changer. And then to start envisioning what it would look like and to set some intentions around it, it's a totally different way of, wake, of, of, of starting the day. The other thing I recommend is the first second of consciousness, maybe the most important second of your life, which is when you regain consciousness waking up and you have a choice in that moment. You can do what most people do, which I did for years, which is like, you know, hit the alarm clock and, you know, oh my God, I can't get out of bed. This is the worst day of my life, right? Or you could sit there and say, thank God I'm alive. Right. Man, what an extraordinary day this is gonna be. This is gonna be an amazing day and 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 open up your body and smile and, and really embody that. And I do that every single day yeah. without fail. And it is priming my mind and my body, right? To have uh, a really amazing day. And so there are these little things that we can do that may seem corny, um, take very little effort, but radically reshape our experience. And, um, and I think they're just game changers. Sure. Sure. Well, and, and back to being corny, uh, do you want to be corny or do you want to be extraordinary? Right. I mean, right. Exactly. you want to try corny. So maybe you have a chance to be ex extraordinary. Yeah. You'll say, Oh, it's too corny. I'm not going to even try, which again, I think it's one of those lies. One of those, those things that we say to ourselves so we can, not be held accountable. That's exactly right. Right. So we, we don't have to take responsibility. Right. And, and, and again, it's a very seductive place to be, which is to give up our own responsibility. And it's really understandable. So I want your listeners and viewers to, to hear from me is there's no blame or judgment. It's a, it's a hard part of our program to change, but when you do and you take on that responsibility for creating an extraordinary day. So in all of that is a immense notion of, potential and possibility and responsibility to create versus having, you know, I'd say own your day or your day will own you Yeah, and it will. Right. And uh, you'll, you'll get to the end of the evening and say, what happened? <laughs> like yeah. that just, that day just happened to me as opposed to, I really created uh, an experience for myself today. Um, that's a very big difference. It is. And, and let me tell you, to your point, I've had more than, a few days where I got up, you know, and, and I, I do have a morning routine, you know, but after my morning routine, then, then I pop in front of my computer and I get to work and I will get up from a day's worth of work, Darren, and go, what did I accomplish today? Yeah, I answered some emails and I did a little bit here and I piddled around a little bit over there, but what did I really accomplish? If I, if I didn't do any of the stuff that I did today, would I've gotten a phone call? Would I've gotten anybody upset? Would I made an impact at all? Because I don't think I did anything. And sure enough, I look at my day and I'm going, well, you know, there's two or three hours I could have done something else with. I mean, uh, but, but I love this idea of creating your extraordinary day. And I think that is, to me, one of the great big take takeaways from our conversation today is get right. up and start envisioning your extraordinary day. Not a great day, not what you're going to do today, but an extraordinary day. What does that look like? The thought of it just gets me excited. Great. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, uh, if you're interested in finding out, you can go to DarrenJGold.com, DarrenJGold.com. And the book, again, is Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. I'm going to put a link here in the show notes. Darren Gold, thank you so much. It's been gold having you on the show, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you again. It's been really wonderful. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. You bet.